Okay, well, welcome uh, to the Lunch and Learn for today. Uh, this is going to be a little bit different as I am with uh, Steve Sue and, and Chad Ackerman, two of our founders in a conference room working on plans for the meetup. So as soon as I hand this over to Logan, we are going to uh, turn off the camera. So don't, don't think we left. It's just complicated with three people in a tiny office here. Um, but we are really excited today to have a talk from Logan Freeman. He is the co-founder and chief development officer of FTW Investments. He was introduced to me by infielder Paul Shannon. So uh, very grateful for that introduction. And today he's gonna talk about recession resistant asset classes, something that we are all um, interested in for sure. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Logan. And Logan, uh, usually how we do the questions is uh, people will just put them in the chat or we'll hold them for afterwards and they can unmute and do the questions. All right, great. Jim, thank you so much. Do you want me to turn my camera on or is that uh, not typical? Yeah, typically that'd be great if we could if we could see you. Um, if you're up okay with that, I'm going to turn mine off just because like I said, I'm in a room here with a few other people. Um, so I'll turn my camera off and I'll mute and I'll just turn it over to you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jim. And I appreciate the opportunity here to speak with the group. I, I named this presentation Recession Resistant Asset Classes and not Recession Proof asset classes because nothing is recession proof. I was talking with a group of investors just yesterday about uh, an industrial opportunity and uh, they were very uh, adamant that uh, they spoke to their experience in 2008 and 2009 in St. Louis, Missouri. I'm based here in Kansas City of, of an industrial deal that they uh, purchased and, and it did not go well. So I'm, I'm very cautious to say recession, recession proof, but we are looking for asset classes that do perform well or better during a recession. I think we're going to talk about that quite a bit. Just a little bit about uh, myself and, and my two business partners. Uh, my, myself, I'm Logan Freeman, Chief Development Officer here at FTW Investments, like I mentioned, based out of Kansas City, Missouri. And um, Corey Tuck is a family office guy from uh, Topeka, Kansas, and uh, took a non-controlling interest in a, a light tech developer and many other companies, but uh, helped to grow that uh, light tech developer from 570 units to 5,500 units across the Midwest and Southeast. And then Parker Webb is my other business partner. Uh, he's a real estate developer, uh, consultant, broker, finance guy, has a master's in real estate. And we joined forces back in 2019 and started buying our uh, first single, our first multifamily uh, assets together. Going into COVID, um, which is the last kind of recession that we had, right? But going into COVID, uh, we had over $30 million worth of neighborhood retail shopping centers under contract. So you can imagine that uh, how I'm, how we're feeling as we're going to COVID and see the world start to, to lock down. And when the Big 12 tournament was shut down here in Kansas City uh, for, for NCAA basketball, we, we kind of knew something was going on. So we re-pivoted into multifamily and we were able to... Really sorry, guys. Apologize for that. Uh, we were able to... Um, by about 1,400 units for over the last two years in, in across four states in the Midwest. And um, now that we've got 26 months worth of data uh, on these different asset classes, we feel really comfortable going back into the commercial space. And that, that's what we're going to talk about today is um, some assets that you may not be thinking about, uh, but that do perform well uh, during a recession. And uh, we've grown our team. We're vertically integrated to about 25 uh, employees here in Kansas City. Uh, we own in Missouri, Kansas, Nebraska, Iowa, really looking to get into Oklahoma and Arkansas. But um, it's, if it's not in the Midwest, it's probably not uh, for us. So that's a little bit about our company. You know, one thing that I like to always do is try to set the stage for what is the recession? And, you know, <laughs> this is kind of interesting because we all saw the um, the, uh, the government try to change the, uh, the definition of a recession. But generally speaking, it's defined as a significant decline in economic activity that's spread across the economy and lasts for more than a few months. And the closest that we've been was recently was the spring of 2020. And even when the economy bounced out of that, it rebounded and saw uh, unprecedented growth due to many different factors, a lot of fiscal stimulus, as we all know. 
But one thing I wanted to talk about here is what's to be expected during a recession? Because you, you hear recession, okay? Uh, but nobody talks about, well, what, what's next? What should we be thinking about as commercial real estate investors? I'm going to set the stage for the worst case scenario here. The rising interest rates are likely to lead to a decrease in consumer spending, uh, leading to declining business revenues, which then in turn uh, talk, you know, go to reduce costs and, and resulting in decrease in unemployment and wages. And these traits of a recession directly impact commercial real estate since lower cons consumer spending affects all areas of real estate. It, it's, it's housing demand, it's travel routes, it's frequency, demand for goods and services. Owners of residential real estate can often see drops in rents and occupancy rates as tenants begin searching for more affordable living options and at times doubling up with roommates to cut costs that are moving in with family. On the retail side, retail owners can see lower sales numbers for tenants as consumers continue to search for money-saving practices. And office owners will often be fighting lower occupancy rates and rent reductions as companies lay off workers, reduce office footprints, or even close their doors completely. Industrial has been the breadwinner due to nearshoring and onshoring of manufacturing operations, e-commerce growth, and the focus on businesses regaining control of their supply chain. So we will talk about that. So that's worst case scenario, and that's how it affects us as commercial real estate investors. There's other impacts, right? But those are some of the, the main ones to be thinking about. On the flip side, we believe that, and so does Russ Gray over at the Real Estate Guys, that the riches are in the niches and that these overarching themes do two things. They instigate fear and they create opportunities for those willing to dive into details and find the deals on the margins, meaning a subset of a subset. So real estate's hyper-local, each geographic location needs to be understood as well as the different pieces inside of the specific asset class. So for example, on the flip side of recession, people will theoretically have less money to put down for a down payment or can't afford the interest payments or the monthly payments due to the high interest rates. And so uh, what do they do? Well, they rent, putting upward pressure on rents and occupancy. So there's always a trade-off and something that we've seen come true um, in, in recent history. So what are some of the impacts on real estate investing? Well, I think we're seeing this right now on asset values. So uh, one thing I, I like to say, we own a brokerage as well, do a lot of transactions on that side for 1031 exchange buyers. But well, you know, sellers all want uh, yesterday's uh, pricing and buyers want tomorrow's pricing. And so there's still this bid ask gap that we're seeing in the marketplace. We have started to see some of the asset values come down in regards to multifamily and a few other asset classes that we'll talk about today. But uh, generally speaking, um, that takes longer. The ripple effect takes longer in the commercial real estate side, maybe than it does in the residential side on the single family home side that you see happen very quickly. So asset values are definitely impacted during a recession. Debt markets, a lot of times debt markets can dry up, you know, liquidity for for banks or they're being more conservative. And so you have to put in more equity capital at the same time when equity investors may be pulling back and may not uh, be feeling as wealthy as they typically do. And so they're not investing as much, maybe sitting on more cash. One thing that we always like to talk about is, you know, Sam Zell and Warren Buffett and all these, you know, prolific investors, uh, they always talk about, you know, you got to skate to where the puck is going, but also when everybody's going left, you got to go Right. And that's tough to do. And it's tough to do if you don't have uh, the data to back this up. So those are some of the, the impacts on real estate investing that I like to talk about, you know, with the risk. I mean, well, if we're going to a recession or, you know, we're thinking about investing during a recession, we have to talk about risk. And what are we you know, talking about in regards to risk is our number one goal with any investment that we make is capital preservation for ourselves and for our investors. And that's what we're here to focus on. And so with this central idea of capital preservation, I'm gonna break down how we can achieve this. I do think that risk is most one of the most misunderstood aspects of a real estate deal. And it can be defined as anything that's not part of the plan. As an operator, uh, being in this business for eight or nine years now, um, saying something is high risk, oftentimes is incorrect. Let me explain. A risk that has a high likelihood of occurrence, but a small impact may be completely acceptable. But on the other hand, a risk with a medium likelihood of occurrence and high impact may be completely unacceptable. And so our risk management plan really represents the below types of a risk here. You're, you're going to see feasibility, uh, time delay, a one-time financial cost, recurring financial cost, uh, the quality of the product that's being developed, 
And so how do you manage that risk properly? Well, you have to enumerate the potential risk. You have to understand them. You have to qualify them. You have to determine that likelihood and then to quantify the impact if that risk comes true. And then you have to develop contingency plans uh, for the risk with the higher impacts. Now, one thing to think about here with, with, with relationships, relationships are always important. People always say, okay, well, I always get deals through relationships, but they're, it's, it's twofold. Relationships bring you opportunities because opportunities don't just thin out, you know, they're not just out there in, in thin air. They're always attached to somebody, uh, but they also, and maybe more importantly, they help you solve problems. And so if you have relationships that can help you solve problems and you've thought about these things and you have contingency plans, that's what it takes to get uh, a deal that we feel comfortable doing. For example, on a most recent acquisition, uh, I get asked, what is the break-even occupancy? This is a big industrial deal. Well, to pay our debt service on the project, we can go to 51% occupancy. Submarket vacancy is somewhere between seven to 8%. Two of the tenants have been there for over 10 years. So we start to develop these contingency plans, start to understand some of these risks. We quantify those. And then once we can figure out if there's a plan forward, we actually take that, that, that step, that next step. If not, that's when you start to walk away from a deal. And each investor, what I've learned over raising uh, a lot of money for projects and investing uh, a lot of money myself is, you know, my risk appetite may be different than yours and vice versa especially if we have different experiences and different time frames for our investment. So all things to be thinking about when we talk about risk, but if you're not thinking about a risk and you're just thinking about upside on a deal, I will tell you um, from operating, brokering over 250 to $300 million of real estate now over the past couple of years, it, things happen and you have to have these contingency plans and relationships to help fix them. So and what, what makes a recession resistant, not recession proof asset class? Well, you know, I think about a few things. So I always like to start with uh, strong fundamentals um, and it's pretty basic. I'm a big Sam Zell guy. Um, his book, Am I Being Too Subtle is absolutely wonderful. If nobody's uh, picked that up, you definitely should, but you have to start with the fundamentals of supply and demand. And this is where I think it's really important to be, um, you know, if you're if you're investing as a sponsor, you know, uh, really being where your uh, investments are. I mean, the competitive advantage that I have here in Kansas City and the Midwest is not the same if I go down to the Southeast. And so, um, you know, with with that being said, a lot of opportunities come to us in markets that we're not in, especially right now. We're definitely not open to to going there. Uh, if I can't manage it, I can't get to it fast. I can't understand the, the market dynamics. So strong fundamentals. And data is great, but data is rear view mirror looking. We have to be looking through the windshield. And the only way that we do that is having conversations uh, with brokers, with owners, with sellers, with all of these different uh, parties to transactions that help us create anecdotal evidence that uh, we may be able to anticipate where the puck is going uh, before we get the data from Yardi and CoStar and Reonomy and all these different groups. So strong fundamentals is extremely important. I love sticky tenants, meaning these are tenants that um, you know aren't going anywhere. Uh, it's costly for them to do so. Uh, maybe they have big manufacturing equipment in a property. Uh, it's very cost prohibitive for them to actually move. Um, so sticky tenants is a great thing to have. Same with multifamily, which we'll talk about here soon. Uh, rental rate resilience. You know, we're not going to see uh, rental rate growth during a recession uh, necessarily. Um, you wouldn't think so. Um, you know, this past recession, if you want to call it that, uh, was a little bit unique, I think, in that stance. But typically, you want to see resilience, meaning, you know, where if, if you have a lot of supply on a project uh, of, of one asset type, uh, what's to, to, to say that one tenant's not going to move from one building to the next? And so you want to have this, this stickiness of resiliency of, of rental rates as well. And so um, I think that you'll hear a lot of people say, well, we invest in class B because class A will move down to class B and class B maybe moves down to class C and, and across that spectrum. Maybe, um, but if the past two years were any indication, that wouldn't be necessarily true in the multifamily state. Um, I think location is extremely important and good locations. You have to have great access uh, for on the commercial side. You have to have great located uh, properties. For example, here in Kansas City, I know um, that you know, if you're, uh, you know, having children or in the children, uh, you know, bearing age, and that's your plan, you're probably not going to live in Kansas City, Missouri proper, unless you're sending your, your kids to private or, or, you know, parochial schools. 
Uh, why? Well, the school district's not very good in Kansas City, Missouri. So we see a big migration to Lee Summit, to Blue Springs, to north of the river, and over the state line to the Kansas side. So maybe that's something you should be thinking about if you're looking at investing in a multifamily property uh, in a market like, like ours. And I'm sure that rings true in other markets as well. So location is extremely important. Modest leverage and capital needs. You know, we positioned our portfolio and I, I sure hope... Mm -hmm. Sorry, guys, my wife just keeps FaceTiming me and I do not know how to turn that off. So I very much apologize for that. But modest leverage, so meaning across the portfolio, have you put bridge debt on a, a project? And do you have rate caps or do you have fixed rate financing? Um, just give me one second, guys. I really, really apologize. No worries, Logan. Okay. My wife never calls me three times like that. So I'm just making sure everything's okay on the home front. But in regards to capital needs, so maybe it's not the best time to get into a big project that has uh, a ton of construction uh, you know, expenses or CapEx um, right now if you're doing some sort of construction loan on a project. So the capital structures for these deals really, really are important during a recession. So we love fixed rate debt that's going to be able to ride out the next three, five years. Uh, and we're not worried about floating our rate or having a rate cap or, um, you know, that leading to a capital call. I mean, that, that could be the worst thing for a real estate sponsor is to say, hey, during a recession, we either have to sell, you never want to be forced to sell, or we're making a capital call. And those things that are, are, are ways that you can mitigate these things if you're to thinking about your capital structure up front. Prime example, guys, we bought 120 unit multifamily property uh, earlier this year. It was in Des Moines, Iowa, and uh, we were able to secure 10-year uh, fixed rate financing at 3.59%. And many investors were asking me, why are you locking that in for so long? And why is that the capital structure? Uh, those same investors now are applauding our, our uh, you know, not foresight, but just uh, our, our uh, approach to putting capital uh, structures in place that are going to protect investors for capital preservation. And that deal was able to pay out much earlier than we originally thought because of, of that and other factors. But long story short, that's one example where I think that there might be an opportunity here, it might be fragmented. But what I'm seeing is um, in talking to brokers um, and myself seeing that in the marketplace is there might be deals that were, were done the last two years with fixed rate debt that are could be in some trouble right now. And then functionality. You know, I think that being able to have a functional space is really important now more than ever. You know, Class A renters are, are looking for more space. They have different amenity packages that they're asking for. And John Burns Consulting does a fantastic job on the multifamily side for that. So uh, just some, some ideas or some things to be thinking about in regards to what makes a recession or an asset class recession resistant. Um, these are the, the top ones that I could get my team and myself on board with. So Moving on to, okay, well, how did certain asset classes perform during difficult economic times? Well, let's talk about retail, you know, because this is an often overlooked asset class that we um, operate in and we own and we are very bullish on. Um, and I just saw in the Wall Street Journal a, a big article saying the revival of retail uh, shopping centers. I wish they wouldn't do that because it's going to make it much more competitive for, for us to continue to purchase these. But you know, 1,880 credit applications from retailers in August of 2022 compared with 1,174 in the year before. What does that mean? Well, the surge of credit applications suggests businesses are looking to expand their operations, add additional locations and storefronts and hire more workers, or buy the products needed to supply their stores with. And so that's really interesting because I like to track capital flows. I track capital flows on the new, new mortgage debt um, as a percentage of GDP, but also uh, these credit applications on the retail side. You know, retail sales hit 6.6 .6 trillion in 2021. That's a 17.9% uptick from the same period in 2020. And brick and mortar sales grew faster, faster than e-commerce for the first time with physical stores sales growing by 18.5% and e-commerce growing at 14.2%. 
When you think about web penetration, web penetration is the percentage of sales that are happening in the retail world, minus uh, gas stations and, uh, you know, like tire centers or something like that, uh, minus those two, uh, web penetration is around 19%. So overall sales, 81% still happening in storefronts. And so, you know, that's one really interesting uh, fact that people are going to stores and they're going to specific stores. So I talk about retail that's done really well. I mean the neighborhood shopping centers that are the ones uh, less than a half a mile away from neighborhoods that you might drive by them on the way to work and you're you're driving by them on the way back. They have e-commerce resistant service-based tenants. So things that you cannot buy on Amazon. An interesting trend that I really like to uh, to see was you know especially when Walmart was overstocked, they were having these fire sales. And so consumers believe that they could find better deals in the stores than they could uh, online, which then drove retail sales, physical store sales even higher, which was really interesting. So monthly retail sales are now 15.5% above the pre-COVID peak of 460.9 billion. And so I mentioned uh, recession and e-commerce resistant services. So what, what is that? Well, they have tenants that can continue to survive and even thrive during economic downturns and the ever increasing, increasing pressure from online shopping platforms. There's also a flight to quality in premium quality offices in, in regard to location in the physical building. Well, why is that important? Well, on the lunch, the lunch hour here in the Midwest, we still have a lot of people going to the office. Could be different in, in gateway markets, but uh, people are still going to the offices here. But they might have to go pick up something for later that night. And so where are they going? Well, they're going to the neighborhood retail shopping center that's close to the suburban class A office building. And so that's another uh, really driving factor to be thinking about. So to be a recession resistant tenant, you must be able to provide services that are necessity to daily life. So think about things such as medical services, veterinary services, you've got gyms in there, small chain grocery stores, uh, discount stores, all of those are gonna survive the test of economic downturns. These are also the same tenants that are able to withstand the growing e-commerce threat to brick and mortar retail. So services like medical imaging or a gym, they're not gonna be able to be purchased online per se. So we, we consider these to be experience-based retail tenants. In addition to the physical services or goods that can make a retail store up that are resistant to e-commerce and economic downturn, the location and the quality of the building are of utmost importance. It's not like a multifamily deal where I can just evaluate uh, the access points to a retail shopping center without actually going to it. And so this is a, you know, not an easy asset class for big players to uh, put a lot of capital into because there's not that many of these that fit our criteria, but also it's very time intensive. You know, these, these, uh, you, you might see a shopping center that you can only get into by going right and not being able to turn left. And well, that's going to really affect the traffic counts. And so we look for traffic counts anywhere between 35,000 and 55,000, uh, you know, per day on the, on the cars here in the Midwest. So what are some of the risk mitigation factors? Well, we've talked about great locations and good access points, e-commerce resistant tenants. So that experience-based or that service-based tenant, uh, below market rents. This is a fragmented marketplace on the retail side where a lot of mom and pops own these and uh, they're not being run professionally per se. They're just managing them themselves. And when they have a vacancy, they put a sign up in the, in the, in the window and say, Hey, you know, this is open for uh, occupancy or this is open for leasing. And so we run into a lot of those uh, mom and pop fragmented ownership, which is, which is great for us as opportunist, opportunistic investors, tenants in tow, being able to be on the ground, knowing all the leasing agents, knowing the tenants in our market allows us to bring tenants to maybe a 50% occupied shopping center. And so that's another way that we can mitigate risk, understanding the different players in, in, in the markets that we're operating in. And we have high quality tenants. So what happened during COVID? Well, you saw a lot of meal prepping services before that, right? And uh, they were all taking retail. This is just one example. They're all taking retail space. Well, a lot of these uh, different businesses that uh, maybe didn't have a strong track record, they were weak businesses already, they got weeded out. And landlords have been a little more um, you know, selective in the tenants that they've been putting into their retail shopping centers because it's costly to have to go re-tenant a, a location, especially on a big space. So where does the opportunity lie? Well, we love neighborhood and strip centers. Those have outperformed uh, malls, they've outperformed big box retail, and uh, they've done very well uh, for the last 26 months. Pad site development, great, great example here. We were able to purchase a retail shopping center, had a pad site, uh, it was an old Burger King, knocked it down, sold it to a bank, and we were, were able to return the equity 
um, to our investors, or a lot of it, 90% of the equity to the investors uh, through selling that pad site in the deal. So, I mean, it was pretty awesome. And there's a lot of opportunities for development of pad sites on these retail shopping centers. Uh, we're seeing smaller concepts like Scooter's Coffee here in the Midwest. Arvest Bank is putting in smaller locations as well. Uh, they're drive throughs uh, so you have to make sure that, that it makes sense for that, but you do have the opportunity uh, to add that. Value add, this is facade, lighting, signage is typical value add here uh, in regards to shopping centers and the widespread inefficiencies in regards to leasing rates and mom and pop owners, we see a big opportunity in the neighborhood retail uh, shopping center space. So moving on to the industrial, man, this is one that I'm very stoked about. I mean, this is some stats from Marcus and Millichap that I I recently pulled and uh, just look at this. I mean, everything that you would want to see in an asset class that's driving performance shows up here. So you have the United States employment, right? Where we got a 2.9% increase year over year. That means jobs, that means manufacturing, it means logistics. Uh, and that's really precedent here in the Midwest for sure. U.S. vacancy, you know, 10 basis points decrease year over year. That's huge, 420 million square feet uh, completed and 8.4% uh, year over year increase. And so um, at least 83 million square feet of industrial leases were recorded last month. That's the highest ever for the month of August. So that was one month and 14% up from the prior year. Uh, and that's directly from CoStar. You know, there's some commonalities between all successful and professional inv investors. They're looking to seek, uh, they're seeking intrinsic value, meaning cash flow. They're thinking long term and they're also always thinking about diversification. So it's easy to see why investors are excited about the industrial asset class in regards to cash flow. And I think this is due to the lack of supply, and I'll talk about that here in a second, accessibility to major freight transportation hubs, their significance in tenant supply chain and manufacturing footprint, and then the continued onshoring of large manufacturing operations to low-cost markets in the Midwest and the Southeast. And I'm going to talk about each one of those. But a record 500 million square feet was absorbed over the last 12 months, uh, ending in March. Asking rents are climbing, as we've, as, we've, as we've seen here. And then centrally located facilities here in the Midwest are at a premium due to the ability to reach 80% of the country in two days or less. That is massive. I mean, 80% of the country uh, in two days or less here in the Midwest and the Southeast. So I'm going to give you an example here. This is just my market. This is Kansas City, but I think this does a great job illustrating this. We've seen 80 speculative warehouse buildings totaling around 32 million square feet of space delivered over the last five and a half years. So there's been no shortage of demand for that space. The occupancy rate's right around 90%. However, one segment has often been overlooked. And that segment is the product that's 75,000 square feet or less. For the 80 spec buildings that have been delivered since the start of 2016, the average building size is 400,000 square feet. And so the median size is 378,000 square feet. And only 10 buildings smaller than 180,000 square feet have been delivered during that time. And so those buildings total about 1.3 million square feet of space, meaning just 4% of all space delivered since 2016 has been targeted at smaller tenants. And so the market was ignoring smaller tenants and local companies looking for the advantages of modern industrial construction, but in need of 75,000 square feet or less. Well, why? Well, it's because install, installing these demising walls and bathrooms and even on the flex spaces, minimal office space, it takes time. And no landlord is excited about the complexities involved in filling a 350,000 square foot building with five to 10 tenants ranging in size from 35,000 to 70,000 square feet. It just doesn't make sense for them. That's just not what they've been typically doing. They're looking for that 500,000 square foot lease, maybe an Amazon or a UPS or something like that. You know, leasing a large building is much easier, uh, or it has been much easier and, and, and much more advantageous for industrial developers. Construction costs on a per square foot basis tend to be higher on these smaller buildings because the projects aren't as flashy and the odds of a Fortune 100 company swooping in to lease that, that whole thing are almost zero. However, there's ample demand for these smaller buildings. And so, uh, as I mentioned before, the occupancy rate for all spec warehouses buildings delivered since 2016 is around 90%. And that, that uh, occupancy in the smaller building is even higher. It's at 98.1%. So demand for spec new space in, in Kansas City has been strong across all sizes. But right now, for a tenant looking for 55,000 square feet or less in a new building, uh, they only have one existing option in our market. And so that's just wild to me to think about that fragmented opportunity uh, that you can go find or build or uh, buy existing um, for, for that marketplace. I talked about the manufacturing and the onshoring. 
I pulled some stats here. I thought this would be very helpful. Over 1,800 companies reshored production in 2021, setting a new record for reshoring activities. And these companies are looking for these logistic facilities, warehouses, and distribution sites. And then obviously the COVID-19 pandemic made the United States manufacturers you know, painfully aware of risk posed by offshore operations and their dependence on global supply chain to move their products back to the United States market. So as a result, many are either planning or already reshoring or nearshoring their production facilities. So in recent months, obviously the trade disputes in the war in Ukraine has, has only added fuel to this fire. But in, in, in fact, manufacturing jobs reshored to the United States exceeded jobs that were offshored by 100% for the second consecutive year. So nearshored and reshored manufacturing facilities are moving to Mexico, Latin America, United States, and right to work states, according to CoStar. And so I love this quote, and I'll just, I'll just leave it here on the industrial side, but this is from a research director over at CBRE. While industrial real estate isn't immune from recessionary headwinds, it does benefit from insulation due to increased e-commerce sales and efforts by businesses to just diversify their supply chains and add and hold extra inventory to guard against shortages. And that's uh, just, I think, you know, sums it up pretty perfectly here for the industrial side. And I also think that industrial, uh, I have a chart here from Marcus and Millichap. Industrial uh, has outperformed almost every other asset class uh, the last 15 or 20 years. And, uh, you know, I think there's reasons for that. Uh, obviously, supply was, you know, an issue going into COVID. But um, now we have the onshoring and reshoring of these, these companies uh, and, and growing e-commerce, uh, as, as we, we've talked about already, uh, that allows for this space to be you know, you know, picked up pretty quickly. So here is another opportunity here is, is the, the low cost basis. You know, we have in Kansas City, you know, on a triple net lease basis, rents between 550 and 950 uh, per square foot. And so to be able to do that, um, you know, on the new product that's being developed, obviously it's going to be a higher rental rate. So it's a little bit higher, but on the existing product, if you can go source those types of opportunities, you can also play in this space of 550 to 650. And uh, even if new product is developed, it's going to be cheaper alternative for some of these uh, these tenants. So uh, at some point, the tenants are just going to have to pay it and they're just going to have to make it make you know, makes sense. That inflection point has not been reached uh, here in the markets that we're in. So we love this. And we also really love the opportunity because of manufacturing equipment being put into these buildings. So like I said, uh, I think on the, the opportunity, uh, I'm very bullish on flex industrial, um, leveraging relationships because these are also held um, not necessarily by uh, large REITs. And if they are, um, they're not selling uh, because they've performed so well. So we're finding opportunities from local private equity groups and other private equity groups that I have relationships with. And we have a low basis. And one thing that's really interesting, we're looking for sites that have the opportunity for truck terminals. And what, is, what does that mean? Well, I mean, you know, it's an industrial building. So if you have a truck terminal right next to it, there's a lot of cross, uh, cross marketing and cross operations that can happen. I have a 3PL company uh, talking to me on a regular basis, looking for more space, looking for truck terminals uh, and looking for uh, tenant and tow development, which I think is a phenomenal way to uh, mitigate risk in today's marketplace. You know, multifamily, I'll spend some time on multifamily. I think everybody here probably is pretty, you know, uh, up to speed on um, the supply and demand imbalance of multifamily and uh, the ability um, and, and, and the way that it has performed the last couple of years. One thing that we'll note is, you know, I have, uh, we have purchased a lot of uh, 1970s or so Class C product. And uh, more recently, uh, we have purchased 1999, 2014, and 2008 uh, product. And one thing to, to be note here is, um, you know, when we look at these opportunities, what happened in the marketplace, we started to see yield on cost for development deals be the same as a value add deal. And to me, that just makes no sense, meaning that buyers were paying up for value add because they believe the opportunity to force appreciation through a cosmetic upgrade or an operational efficiency outweighed uh, the, the actual product that they were purchasing. And maybe that reigned true in a Phoenix or in Austin, Texas. But if you're here in the Midwest, you know, there's still a lot of land around where we live and you can go build new products, the same yield on cost as a multifamily value add deal that was built in the fifties. Um, you know, you really, as an investor, have to start thinking about the risks involved and the exit plan uh, for that product. And so uh, I think the multifamily's done a phenomenal job. What's been tough in the, in the marketplace, when we track um, Green Street Property Price Index, we saw a massive decline, obviously, 
in commercial prices in April of 2020. That lasted to about October or November. And then we started the uptick, okay? That's when the uncertainty was taken out of the marketplace. That's when all the fiscal stimulus was, was dumped into the, to the system. That's when debt was extremely cheap. And uh, there was a lot of people purchasing that. Well, I will tell you that we bought, I think, a thousand units from April to October. And then from October on, uh, it was very difficult for us to add the 350 or 400 units that we have in the last 18 months. And so one thing to think about here is, you know, when everybody's going into a, <clears throat> one asset class, it can make it, you know, uh, a little overpriced. And so we're really a big basis buyer when it comes to this. Um, but I think the headwinds um, in regards to multifamily, you can mitigate those if you, uh, and, and capture the tailwinds, if you're able to leverage those relationships and actually find you know, good deals. I mean, they're out there. We, we've bought some distressed deals this year, which has been great. So multi, multi-family vacancy rate, 5.8% in the first quarter of 2020. You know, it's it's below the average of 7.6%. We've all, all seen and probably been benefactors of the rental increases. Uh, I think Phoenix, Arizona was somewhere between 17 and 20%. Here in Kansas City, depending on who you ask, um, we're about 7 to 10%. And so that wasn't any of our pro formas. You know, that's great. Um, but we also had rising construction costs. And we have labor costs that are also, um, you know, rising. So you have to think about the trade-off there uh, as well. Do they outpace and does NOI growth continue to happen? Probably. Um, but, you know, being able to go buy a 1950s Class C building uh, for $100,000 a door here in Kansas City when rents are $750 just doesn't make sense, even if I can supposedly get to the rents to $1,150 or $1,200. Uh, we're just not willing to take that risk. Typically, a deal that we purchase looks like this. You know, sixty-five to eighty-five thousand a unit. Uh, In-place rents are somewhere between seven fifty to eight fifty, and we're getting close to that one percent price to rent ratio. So, um, just some things to think about on the multifamily side. Risk mitigation. We've talked a little bit about wallet share. Um, this is, you know, something that I think is widely accepted. Is you're not supposed to um, be paying more than thirty percent of your, uh, you know, income towards your housing. Well, in Kansas City, I think we're somewhere between nineteen and twenty-two percent. In other markets, that's a little bit higher obviously, but I like to, we like to really, you know, find deals that uh, are below that 25% threshold, which allows us to feel comfortable about a, a continued value add plan. At some point, uh, rental increases will stop. We've seen them, you know, kind of taper off just a little bit um, and they may, you know, decline uh, depending on the, the supply that's coming in. So yeah, you know, you need to be thinking about that in all the markets that you're, you know, interested in investing on the, on the multifamily side. So uh, the growing cost to construct new supply, you know, one thing that I don't have here on the slides to be thinking about is the build for rent space. And I'm sure some folks here are, are involved in that. We are not in that space quite yet, but that is another risk to be thinking about to the multifamily world is, okay, we have um, big starts on the multifamily side. When is that going to be delivered? Okay, uh, what's the price point? It's all class A, typically, unless it's developed, um, you know, using low-income housing tax credits. Uh, but we also have this bill for rent kind of entrance. And I have talked to a decent amount of folks who uh, have really started to make big strides in that space. And I just wonder how that's going to impact uh, multifamily going forward um, and how that might, uh, you know, did this, you know, affect people's decisions in regards to, to investing here. So something that I'm tracking very closely. I still think the opportunity here is in class B and C opportunities when they're right, you know, price right. And I do think there will be some opportunities here in the near future. Well located is, is got to be uh, still, it's, you know, location, location, location is still going to be one thing that I always am going to be harping on. Um, and there's high transaction volume. So the exit strategy on the multifamily, uh, when debt is uh, able to be priced accordingly, uh, typically you can trade out of these deals uh, maybe a little faster than if you own an office building or a retail shopping center. Ability to scale, you know, we've all uh, probably been involved in single family at some point, or maybe we weren't, but uh, the ability to scale on the multifamily side, you know, we started buying 26 unit buildings and 35 unit buildings and, you know, about 426. And now every deal that we've looked at or are willing to kind of go forward on really needs to have the um, ability to have a property manager on site. We really like that. We do have a decent amount of scattered site here that we manage internally. And uh, the, the uh, the challenge uh, with that is is just that, you know, you don't have somebody on site and that can be difficult because they're managing multiple multiple properties and they're just not getting the same attention. The tenants aren't getting the same attention. Now, typically that's maybe lower scale or lower and they don't want that high touch, but, um, you know, it just kind of depends on, on where you're located at. So I'm going to wrap this up and open it up for questions. Um, yeah, wow, I talked for 40 minutes. So um, I think that, uh, let me just, 
to have some closing thoughts here because I think this is important. So Sam Zell always says that opportunity is very often embedded in the imbalance between supply and demand. It can be rising demand against flat or diminishing supply or flat demand against shrinking supply. But at some point, those two lines are going to intersect. And when they do, people typically make money. And so as we evaluate the real estate market as a whole, and especially other property types and sectors, uh, we notice that those other supply demand imbalances are riper for the picking than let's say multifamily. That could change and we're staying very, very in tune with that. But we've got data and anecdotal evidence now to support that on the physical supply and demand side, we have stronger demand than is largely believed to exist standing against flat or flattening supply. And on the capital market side, those properties are trading at spreads above their historical cap rates. So what that means is there's properties are performing better physically than the market believes that, that the capital markets, due to some foundational misunderstanding about those properties, are not highly demanding these and bringing the asset prices down to historical lows. So if you believe that capital demand for these assets is going to come back once these assets have a longer time to prove their resilience and necessity in the physical marketplace, as we do, then now is the time to acquire and be thinking about other asset types at a discounted price. And uh, that's what we're looking to do and, and trying to help investors do is position ourselves to sell back into a higher capital demand, thus higher price market. And uh, that, those are my closing thoughts. I, you know, There's some asset types that I didn't touch on, self storage and mobile home parks being uh, two of them. I just didn't think I could get all of that in there um, for today's presentation, but definitely um, do uh, have a lot of experience and, and like those two asset classes as well for, for the same reasons that I talked on, on industrial and in um, and the multifamily side. Thanks, Logan. That was, uh, that was great. So we will open it up for questions. And I know sometimes um, this, this group pretends to be shy, which gives me the opportunity to ask the first question generally, and then we'll see what else rolls in. Um, sure. So if you have a question, uh, feel free to just type it in the chat. If you'd like to uh, ask it yourself, you can uh, virtually raise your hand and, and we'll, we'll call on you and then you can ask it yourself. That, that's a lot easier than listening to me read, but up to you guys. Um, so it looks like you know, you're, you're into a lot of different asset classes or you're looking for deals in multiple asset classes. And I just wanted to understand, are you operating those asset classes? And if so, how do you get the expertise to say jump into retail from multifamily? Because you know the way we look at things is, and for me personally, you know, a couple times that deals haven't worked out for me are ones where I'm partnering with uh, an operator who is getting into a new asset class and they don't know what they're doing. So can you yeah. talk about how you develop that expertise when you're when you're doing something new? Yeah, great question. And the the crazy part about the answer is. We as a group have more experience on commercial assets than we do in multifamily, even though the portfolio does not reflect that. And it, I think it comes down to a timing uh, component. You know, when we were going into COVID and we had all those shopping centers under contract, we had no idea what was going to happen in regards to the economy, what was going to be shut down, where the debt markets were going to go. But we had confidence in the multifamily side that everybody was going to need a roof over their head. And so um, I think I can speak to just going back uh, with my, my partner. So I have experience in the single family home space, neighborhood retail shopping centers and multifamily, either on a broker or a ownership standpoint. I was the head of acquisitions for a $50 million fund when I first got started. And then Parker has, has 11 years of commercial real estate experience. And then Corey uh, on the multifamily side. So we kind of just brought all of that different experience and, and past uh, deals to the table back in 2019 when we started. Uh, but the opportunity that we saw during COVID was not in the commercial space. It was in the multifamily space. And so we have been learning uh, to vertically integrate and to manage those assets uh, the last 15 or 16 months. And, you know, I think we, we worked with some good property management companies, but at the end of the day, you know, when you are uh, owning and, and a fiduciary of investors capital, um, we just felt like we needed to step in and, and do the management ourselves. On the commercial side, when you think about the management for maybe a multi-tenant industrial building, you know, there's, there's uh, building engineers that are on site here uh, instead of property managers. You still have a property management company. Maybe it's a Cushman and Wakefield or it's a CBRE 
or a Kessinger Hunter. These are large groups that specialize in commercial property management, but it comes down to understanding the, the tenant's needs in regards to mechanical, electrical, plumbing, because if you're doing manufacturing in a building, you have different HVAC needs, you have different cleanliness needs, and you have different access point needs. Uh, and then it comes from, from a leasing standpoint. So these uh, industrial and, and retail deals are really front-loaded lease negotiation opportunities. And we've we've negotiated over 250 triple net leases over the last eight years. And so really when it comes down to the management side, it's uh, CAM, so common area maintenance reconciliations, it's tenant relationships, and it's front loaded with leasing negotiations. And we're involved in all of the, the leasing negotiations. Day-to-day -day property management, you know, is collecting rent, pushing the snow, making sure that tenants uh, have access to the buildings. And if something happens, a tree falls down or something like that, it gets moved off. It's a lot less uh, involved than maybe a multifamily deal where we're turning units on a regular basis, we're showing units, we're having to, to get people in and out all the time. So much easier on these larger industrial and retail shopping centers, but the, the, the asset management actually component is much more front loaded in regards to lease negotiations and ongoing uh, with leasing. And so it's just, it's, it's a little bit of a different component, uh, but we just bring past experience and actually have more commercial than we do on the multifamily side. Excellent. Thank you. We, we have a question here from Chad. You're just going to have to listen to yeah. him and not see him because we're sharing space here. No, thanks again, Logan, for coming on and great information. Uh, a lot of the people that are on the call and that are part of our community are LPs on the LP side of things. This is all great information. Any recommendation around kind of where we ought to get our portfolio to be recession proof with all these different asset classes that you're talking about? I know it's not an exact science, a prescribed number, but just kind of what you kind of coach people on of how they ought to diversify. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, for us, when we think we talk about portfolio allocation, you know, there are some LP investors that just say, hey, I'm multifamily, I've had success, I understand it, I like it, and that's where I'm going to be. We started to do more commercial for two reasons. One, we thought that the opportunity was there and the macro trends were, were tailwinds. But but the, the third part of that component was our investors started to ask us, hey, we have done a lot of class B and C multifamily in the Midwest with you. Are there other opportunities that we can get into that you guys have, you know, you talk about commercial all the time. Uh, but you've never brought us an opportunity. And so um, I, I'm not necessarily one to ever recommend uh, how much allocation for, for what asset class. I would say this, um, if you believe that um, you dive into the e-commerce sales and retail sales, and you maybe even see a shopping center that you go to on a regular basis, if you use the product or see those trends and are interested in it, then I think it's it's good to go pick one and, and really start to understand the dynamics of that. Uh, Meaning on the industrial side, some of our retail investors, and I say retail, meaning literally retail shopping center investors, they all, they don't see the industrial world the same as they might see the retail world. And so um, I, I think that uh, from my, my experience talking with investors, I just say, well, you know, what, what is it that you see going on in the economy, in the, in the, in the commercial real estate world, and you see other folks kind of getting into and what piques your interest? That typically either goes to retail or industrial, or uh, we even do office, believe it or not. We, we, we own office assets and, and manage and lease those as well. Um, but I think that, um, you know, with multifamily, where it was from a, a pricing standpoint the last 12 months, we have had to bring uh, different opportunities that were, you know, uh, you know, priced at a good price from an intrinsic value standpoint. So, you know, I think that, uh, you know, it's probably a specific answer for each investor. But, you know, I think it's good time to be looking at these other asset classes now that we've got 26, 27, 28 months worth of data to see, you know, during COVID-19, how did they perform? And that's the only reason we got back into the retail side. I think the industrial side has performed well and, and, and speaks for itself on a lot of different ways, but it does take a lot of education on my part, um, having webinars, going through, hey, well, what is a flex industrial op, you know, office building? And the way that I, I kind of say that is, is have you ever watched the show, The Office? 
and most people have, and you think about, okay, well, Michael is up there in the office with Jim and Pam, but where does he always go and, and break stuff? And he goes down to the warehouse. That's a flex industrial building. So I just try to make it really real and how it's going to be used. Uh, and then you have to talk about lease structures and negotiation. And that's the real big differentiating factor on commercial than it is on multifamily is the way that these leases are structured, the way that the properties are managed. So I'm so glad that Jim asked that. Uh, but it's really important because if you don't have experience negotiating a 75,000 square foot lease, guess what? You just locked yourself into five years of of bad of, of a bad lease term. And that doesn't work well uh, when you're talking to investors. So you better have experience negotiating those leases and having 250 to 300 of those under our belt uh, felt very good about that. Um, oh, great. I, I got a, another question for you. Um, you know, retail you talked about, and that's been, you know, a, I don't know how to say, COVID complicated asset class where industrial has really had the benefits, benefited through COVID. I think you could probably put office space and maybe hospitality on the same side as retail. So when you're looking at all these different asset classes, where are the best deals found? I would imagine that it's hard to find something in industrial but retail, you might have more opportunities. Can you talk about the market for those asset classes a little bit? Absolutely. And um, the retail shopping centers, you have to be really well versed on the difference of the subsets of the subset of retail. So you have power centers, which have big box retail. You have malls, you have open air malls, then you have strip centers, and then you have community centers and neighborhood retail shopping centers. And so in the subset that we uh, purchase, it has to be in and around single family homes, multifamily, it has to be a, just surrounded by good subdivisions. And the reason for that is it's the, it's the easiest place for people to go. These are not destination uh, spots for them. They may go down to, you know, Von Mar or something in the shopping district. That's fine. Uh, but these are there. They're, it's easy for them to get to. And a lot of times they're, they're, disc, they're discount stores. So um, they, you're picking up the milk on the way home or you're getting your tires done and you're going to get your hair cut and you get the chiropractor done uh, or physical therapy or it's a restaurant. You know, those are, so the tenant mix is important there too as well. Strip centers have also done well. Strip centers would be the ones that are on a, you know, a main, a main thoroughfare or a road. It's got five or six tenants in there, uh, probably 25, 35,000 square feet. Uh, but those are the two that we really focus on. And the way that we find those, well, you know, it's pretty easy because there's not that many that meet the traffic counts that we do. So we just pull lists. We start making calls. We talk to brokers in the different marketplaces that we're interested in. And uh, we start making offers after we can get in front of those folks. So a lot of those are off-market or relationship-driven um, deals. On the industrial side, um, that is a hard place to, to play in because cap rates have, have been compressed. Um, but the flex industrial is one spot that I would say is less been less looked at as from the large players because it's not one lease with 350,000 square foot. It may be four or five tenants with 55 to 75,000 feet. And uh, it's not a coupon. I mean, you know, I mean, we have to go in and they're probably gross leases. So we have to renegotiate leases. We have to account for downturn. There's probably some CapEx that needs to be done. Parking lot, HVAC, roof, those things, facade upgrades, that all needs to be done. And so it's a value, I mean, it's really a value add deal. You don't find a lot of these flex industrial deals that are 100% occupied at, a, at a, good, um, a good cap rate. You know, you have to go in with a business plan to actually go do some work that's going to take, you know, 18 to 24 months to get it to a part where you can then go and sell to maybe a fund that that just wants to put you know into the fund and and get a five six percent return. Um, so finding those through uh, again um, our broker network, I call it the FTW Strategic Alliance Network. I mean it's my job to know just about everybody uh, here in Kansas City doing deals. So found that opportunity through a um, a group called the Society of Exchange Counselors, and uh, turns out I knew the ownership group as well. So uh, we were not the highest bidder uh, on that deal whatsoever, but uh, we're able to leverage our relationship with the broker and uh, and the ownership group to get them comfortable to sell to us. So it's just you know they come you know one every six months comes to us um, on the industrial side, but uh, you know it's definitely not uh, as easy to go find a, as it would be on the neighborhood retail shopping centers. Excellent. Thank you, Logan. I am going to do an awkward pause here for a second to see if anyone else has any questions, but we are uh, close to the hour. So this has been fantastic. I'm going to wait for a second and see what we got. Oh, look at that. Um, Ryan says, is there an on the fringe asset class you're evaluating as another possible 
oops, it leaped off. Um, I think you get the gist. So is there another well, another possible re recession resistant asset class that's on the fringe? Yeah, yeah, there is. And it's mobile home parks. And uh, I'm keenly aware of uh, specific mobile home parks in different areas. What, what I have not been able to wrap my head around yet is the actual uh, management of mobile home parks and uh, the moving and uh, toting of different, uh, you know, homes in the in the parks. Because if you're going to get new tenants and they're going to own their, uh, you know, they're going to own their home, uh, well, they have to get it there if they're coming in. And so there's been a huge backlog on new homes and toting companies being able to actually move the product into the facility. And so um, for me, I haven't been able to wrap my head around uh, the ability to manage those effectively. Um, supply and, and demand is, is great. I mean, there's 14 mobile home parks developed uh, in the whole United States last year. So it's actually a diminishing supply because people are buying them, scraping them and building multifamily. So it's actually going away, which is really interesting. Uh, but the management side, the operation side, the toting in there and the new, um, you know, the new uh, homes is, is really difficult to wrap my head around. I mean, I've even heard of mobile home park operators, um, you know, going out buying old mobile homes off of uh, Craigslist, fixing them up and bringing them in and selling them to their residents. I am not set up to do that. Um, and it just takes a lot more to be vertically integrated and to be successful on the operational side. And it's just not scalable for us. So that's why I'm on the fringe uh, with that. Uh, as an LP, uh, mobile home parks, if you can find a, a strong operator, I, I would feel very comfortable about that in a good market. Excellent. Well, we are at the time, so um, we're going to close up here, but Logan, thank you very much. This was fantastic. If people want to connect with you, what's the best way they can do that? Well, I'm very active on LinkedIn, so you can search Logan Freeman, Mr. Kansas City on LinkedIn. I post daily over there about things that we're doing. Um, our website's ftwinvestmentsllc.com. You can search FTW Investments, and I'm sure it will, will pull up for you, but uh, LinkedIn is a great place to connect with me. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for the, for the content. We appreciate it. And um, we'll definitely be watching you and see you on down the road. And just a reminder to everybody, um, this is the last week to sign up for the meetup in the left field, October 20th and 21st in Columbus, Ohio. So um, if you're interested in joining us, please get on that right away. So with that, thank you again, Logan. We appreciate thank you guys. and FTW Investments being on with us. Thank you so much. Thanks, Logan. Take care, everybody. You do that?